so next we've got a woman after my own heart, like, you, like she doesn't even know. She's brilliant and really beautiful, and she works in caves. Okay, and I have to say, when I was a little girl, my aunt, one of my crazy aunts, took me to this place called Crystal Clay Caves. I have no idea where it was, I was too little. But I remember walking into the space and seeing stalactites and stalagmites and being so like freaked out and just like in awe of how beautiful, beautiful nature was and all the little creatures that lived in this place. And oh my God, it was fantastic. And I actually went home and, and this was before the era of computers. And yeah, I know the younger folks like don't eat, would, would, wouldn't understand this. But we used, when we made designs, we didn't do it on a computer with like cute little design programs. We actually would do it inside shoe boxes and we call them dioramas. Okay, and we would make it out of stuff out of like, make my stalactites and stalagmites out of um, um, flour and water so that it was clay, and it, I thought it was really kind of cool. I colored it with food coloring. I know I'm very, very old school. But without a further ado, we've got the amazing Hazel Barton. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's, uh, it's such a pleasure to come here. I'm going to talk to you about what I do, and I am a, a cave microbiologist. And this is a, a photo that was taken from my vacation last week. I spent a week camping in a cave, and this is where we were camping. So I have a rough kind of life. Um, what I'm going to talk about is what I do, which is to study microorganisms on, in caves. So that makes me a cave microbiologist. So a lot of people wonder, what's a, What's a microorganism? What is it? And it's anything that you need a microscope to see. So if you look at your hand right now, you have about 50,000 microbes on your hand. Can you see them? No? That's why you got to wash your hands. You want to make sure that you only have the good microbes on your hands. So this is what they look like when you um, look at them with a microscope. This is a very high, powerful microscope. It's called an electron microscope. And this is what we would call bacilli. So there's only a couple of shapes that we can have with um, bacteria, microorganisms um, that I study. They can either look like sausages, like these guys, or they look like soccer balls. So these sausages here are so microscopic that you can put 2,000 of them head to tail across the head of a pin, and we'll just about make each side. So that's why you can't see them. So it's very hard to figure out who's who when the only options you've got are sausages and soccer balls. How do you create a tree of life? How do you figure out who is related to who when everybody essentially looks the same? So what we did is we also stole from CSI and we started using genetic fingerprinting. So what we do is we go into these microbes and on the outside they all look the same, but on the inside they have different pieces of DNA. And just like you have a piece of DNA that shows you who your parents are, yours is just a little bit different, we can take advantage of that with microbes. So we pull out these genetic fingerprints and we look at how microorganisms are related to each other. And people started doing this about 30 years ago when I was a kid and I got interested in microbes. I watched a, a TV show where David Attenborough said every glass of water you drink has about 200 microbes in it. And I was like, Ugh, I don't want to drink them. Oh, so I stopped drinking for about three days and my mom forced me to drink then. Um, but anyway, if we, if we take the, um, the genetic fingerprint out and we build a family tree and we get a really big tree, and what we can do is put all life on Earth into this tree, and that's what we call it the big tree. And when this was done for the first time, what we found is that there were a group called the bacteria, and those are those soccer balls and sausages, and everybody knows what those are or has heard of them, things like salmonella and E. coli. The other group that we saw on this big tree were the eukarya. Now, we're eukaryotes because we have a nucleus. I'm going to show you where you are. You are right there, OK? So that little branch on this big tree that I put there represents all the animals that you can see on Earth. So we're, we're the representative animal for that group, the homo sapiens. Then we've also got the, the plants and the fungi in these tippy-tip branches. One of the other things that was discovered was that there was a form of life out there that looked like a bacteria. It was kind of a sausage or a soccer ball. But when you looked on the inside, it looked more like us. And those are the archaea. And you may have heard of them before. They're called extremophiles, organisms that live in extreme environments. 
So what we do in my lab is study all microorganisms that live in extremely starved cave environments. That's why we go into them. And what we realize is that most of the life on this tree, down to this area here we call the, um, the break point right there, everything on that side of the tree, you can see plants and animals and insects, but everything else is microscopic. And it turns out that the majority of life on our planet are related to these organisms that are on your hands, but you can't see them yet. So why do we do cave microbiology? What's the point of going into a cave to do microbiology? And I want to understand how microbes like a, make a living when there's no sunlight energy. So where we are, our, our ecosystem is all based on sunlight. So the sunlight makes the grass grow, and then the cows eat the, the grass, or the corn grows from the sunlight, and then we eat that. And that's where our ecosystem is based. But in a cave, there's no sunlight. So the microorganisms have to make an, a, a living in the absence of that sunlight. And what I do is I go into caves and try and figure out how they do that. So being a cave microbiologist is not as glamorous as being the Da Vinci detective. Um, I got to tell you, the only reason I'm wearing heels right now is for you guys. I would have flip-flops on otherwise. Um, this is more how I like to spend my Saturday afternoons. Um, in England, we call this the clag. It's very sticky mud. Um, and you can see, if you can't make it out, there's actually somebody trying to climb a ladder there. So I'm trying to do microbiology, you know, when you go into the doctor's office and they take swabs and samples and do that. That's what I'm trying to do under these kind of conditions. So it's no wonder there aren't many of us. Um, this is uh, my technician, Brad, and he's illustrating that we need to use a lot of ropes. We have to do a lot of technical work. Um, so I actually trained Brad, who was my research technician in my university, how to use ropes, how to slide down ropes. Um, he's about to slide down a 300-foot rope there. He has a big pack on his back because our sampling site is so far from the entrance, we have to camp underground to do our research. So he's got his, his sleeping bag and all his food in there. So when I taught him how to do it, I was like, where are we going to do this? Where are we going to teach Brad how to use ropes? So we have a big science center, which has a big four-story atrium. So what we would do on Friday afternoon is tie a rope around one of the pillars and throw it down. We'd have a four-story drop, and we'd go up and down on the ropes. And then the, the police, the campus police, would come by and just assume that nobody would ever do that without a permit, so they would let us do it. That's how we, <laughs> we learned to do it. Um, sometimes it gets quite small. This is the top of somebody's head. I know that my helmet is eight and a half inches across, and that is eight and a half inches. So if I go up to an opening and I put my hand in it like that, and my hand fits, I don't have to take my helmet off. And I also, it's, it's pretty easy. Eight and a half inches is nothing. The tightest I've ever done in a cave is six and a half inches, which is about that. And you have to take your helmet off and slide it ahead of you. Also, you can't breathe, because when you breathe, your chest gets bigger. So what you have to do is, if you feel that, you feel how your chest collapses. So what you do is you blow out all the air, and then you kind of push your way through, and you can actually squeeze through. I have a friend, Nancy, that the smallest she's ever done is five and a half inches, and the bit that stops her is her cheekbones right here. I was behind, we were exploring a cave one time, and I was behind her. And um, anyway, her underpants kind of came off. And it, so, <laughs> you always want to make sure you do that kind of stuff with your best friend. All right. So it can get tight. It can also get tight and full of water. So you're doing the same kind of thing. This is a cave in New York, so you can imagine how cold it is up there. That's, that water is probably about 42 degrees centigrade. And we call it an ear dipper, because he's got one ear dipping in the water. Um, and then sometimes there's just no air there at all. So what we have to do is cave diving. So we, we take scuba tanks, and we actually go into the caves. And that takes an awful lot of training to do that, and also do that and try and do science at the same time. So it's really a very fun job. And when they said, we'd like you to come here and talk about your fun job, I was like, yeah, I have a fun job. <laughs> so what do we get out of cave microbiology? What's the point of going into caves? What do we learn? Well, what we lo look at are some of the applications of this. So we're not just doing it because it's an interesting thing to do. And it is really interesting. Our bugs do crazy things. They chew into rock. They pull energy out of the atmosphere itself. But there are also a lot of applications for people. 
So one of the things we do now is drug discovery. We look at these microorganisms that have come up with a lot of different ways of solving problems underground. And those different ways of solving problems can be used for us to solve problems. So because there's not a lot of energy down there, they all have to fight and they all have to compete with each other. So they make these lethal chemical weapons. And those turn out to be new forms of antibiotic. So we work with a drug company and we're discovering new antibiotics that could help to save people in the future. We also work with issues related to climate change. You see these beautiful formations here. They're precipitated as calcium carbonate. And we know that microbes in caves can help precipitate calcium carbonate. The way they do it is they pull carbon dioxide out of the air. So they can actually take CO2 and turn it into rock and fix it in a geologic form, which could be stable for millions of years. There's a lot of potential for that. We also do bioremediation. And someone's going to talk to you about some of the pesticides that get put on the, the ground and the bad things they do to frogs. We know that microorganisms in caves can actually break down some of these pesticides and take them out of the, the water. Not only is that good for the frogs, but that also helps us because we don't want to be drinking that pesticide contaminated water either. And then we try to understand life on Earth. Life on Earth formed before we had photosynthesis, before that sunlight energy could be trapped and turned into plants. So how do microorganisms do that? What were the mechanisms that they came up with before photosynthesis, before 3.2 billion years ago, when photosynthesis first started happening? How do we figure that out? So caves are really useful for giving us that information. So I'm just going to show you some of my holiday pictures so you can see. Um, one of the things we do is we, we call it geomicrobiology because we're doing microbiology in geologic environments. And just like our last speaker, being a scientist is about studying everything that's relevant to what you're doing. So geology is really important when you're studying microbes in caves. So we call it geomicrobiology. And we look at caves formed in silica. And there is only one place in the world that caves form in silica, and that's Venezuela in South America. Now, getting there is quite tricky. This is one of my undergraduate students. And it's hard to tell what he's doing there, but he's holding the piece of string that holds the door closed on the airplane. Um, so uh, I, one of my students actually had to get a passport to come on this trip. So uh, it was quite a shock to him. Not only was there no seatbelt rule and no, no smoking rule, but you to hold the door closed while you were in the plane. <clears throat> this is where he went. This is the Tapui Mountains of Venezuela. This is Kukanan. So yes, I do have a cool job. Um, it took four days to get there. And we had four plane flights and then a helicopter ride. And we got on top. And I decided that it was such a cool trip for my students that therefore they should have to carry me around for the entire rest of the, <laughs> the trip. So this is them holding me. This is more likely the kind of shoes I'll be wearing. And we're on top of this tapui. And it's made of silica. It's made of uh, an orthoquartzite. So it's basically glass. And it's really insoluble. Has anybody seen Up, the movie Up, the animation? Yeah, you guys all saw that? This is where they, they it's, this is the same place. This is Roraima Tapui that they based Up on. And it's very hard for caves to form, so there shouldn't be any caves up there. And we went up there, and there's a 16 kilometer long cave. And we think that the microbes are involved in its formations. This is my postdoc. And you can see there's all these white dots all over the ceiling. And we're pretty sure those white dots are the microbes, and that the microbes are actually eating into the rock and helping form the cave. Why this is important is because if we go to places like Mars, the kind of caves that you would find on Mars would be very similar to this. We think that. The energy that's supporting that is radioactive decay. So the radioactivity breaks apart water and generates hydrogen gas. And that hydrogen is powering the system. It's a really amazing place to do research. The other thing we do, and this is kind of related to Mars, is one of the things we found in caves is that microorganisms are very adapted to starvation. They're really good at scavenging tiny amounts of energy. And when we take those microbes and we compare them to everything else in the database, we always get the same hit. And that's from a colleague of mine who isolates microorganisms in this kind of environment. And this is a spacecraft assembly facility. So when you're going to build your spacecraft, you've got to put it together. You've got to assemble all the parts into a spacecraft. So that's called a spacecraft assembly facility. And it turns out that there are microbes in there. 
and they've adapted to live in that environment that has no energy in it. So we actually find the same kind of microbes. So we help NASA with something called planetary protection. And what that means is we can help them understand how microorganisms can grow in and around their spacecraft and how they can stop that happening. And that's really important because this is the Phoenix lander that was on Mars last summer. You guys remember hearing about it? It had its scoop and it would come down and pick up sediments. You don't want to send a bug up on that spacecraft that's going to land on Mars. That bug is going to fall off and then start growing and contaminate Mars. So we help them understand that. And this is me helping them. This is the Phoenix lander behind them, behind us. We're at Kennedy Space Center. It could be anybody. I could be telling you it's anybody. But I'm the, the one on the right-hand side. And I love the suit. The suit was so cool. They gave it to me. Awesome. I get to wear a suit. And it has these straps on it. And I thought, it's kind of like Star Trek, you know, like Battlescar Galactica. It's really cool. Um, they were actually loading the propellant. There's a rocket on the top that actually takes the spacecraft out of the gravity well of Earth and sends it to Mars. And they were loading it for a propellant, which is highly explosive. And those straps are actually for them to help pull your body from the building if it blows up. <laughs> but <laughs> nobody told me that when I was in there. I haven't learned that afterwards. <laughs> anyway, and then um, this is the nicest thing about my job. There's the Phoenix lander that I got to help make sure had no microbes on it landing on Mars. They had the um, Mars observer take a photo of it. And you can see it. This is an enlargement here flying down across that crater to land on Mars. It was really a, a very exciting moment. So I just really quickly want to tell you how I got to be where I'm at. So here's where I started. Of course, I had a fear of math and a fear of chemistry. So I avoided both and went straight for biology. OK, it was a, a good plan. And when I was doing my undergraduate degree, I realized I love microbiology. I love that you can, you can stick your finger on an agar plate and something disgusting grows up. So I started doing microbiology. And then I started trying to understand how proteins bind to DNA and control things in microbes. And to do that, I had to do biochemistry. Now I had a fear of chemistry, but now I'm doing biochemistry. And the reason was that chemistry didn't seem to make much sense to me until I needed it to do something, until it became a tool for me to use. And then it was like, oh, chemistry is really cool. I love chemistry. So there we have our chemistry. And then because I was looking at how things were moving around in solutions, I got to do physical biochemistry. So not only was I doing chemistry, but there was physics. And that had math. <sighs> Now I do microbial ecology. So I took everything I learned in that microbiology and I apply it to microbes in the environment. And to do that, I have to do something called phylogenetics. And phylogenetics is building those trees. And you have to use a lot of math to see how DNA orders organisms. So there is a lot of math in that. And then we do geology, which I already talked about. We're geomicrobiologists. And to do that, you have to look at how microbes alter the surface of things. So you end up doing materials chemistry, which is looking at surfaces. And that's got chemistry. And then that's how I came to be a cave microbiologist. But what I wanted to show you guys is that's not a straight line. The most important thing is for you to follow what interests you. All of this is exciting. If you want to go be a da Vinci detective, that's really cool. Just go where your interests take you, because you never know where you're going to end up. But the journey is just as much fun. And you may end up having a really cool job as well. So I'm just going to end there. I just got to thank the people that, that sponsor us. Um, and I can't do this on my own. Nobody works on their own in a lab. I work with a lot of people in a lot of different institutions. And we have a really good time. So thank you. That was awesome. Thank you. Cool. Proofs positive women rock science. OK? <laughs> However, I have to ask a question that I'm sure you get a lot. What's a nice girl like you doing in caves so often? Believe me, I only look nice now because I'm dressing up for you guys. Um, actually, my mom, when I was a little girl, my mom really thought that I should be a secretary. And I started caving when I was 14. And I'd come home. Caving, there's actually a term. A term, yeah, okay. to go in caves. And I'd come home covered in mud. 
and I'd like take my clothes off and dump them and she'd be like, oh, it's just not what girls do. Have you, what about knitting? What about crochet? <laughs> Mom? Um, yes, so uh, I, never did, I never did follow that. I had a, a really incredible grandfather who always, um, you know, we'd go out, he'd buy me science kits for Christmas and we'd go out into the shed and we'd like set things on fire and do all kinds of crazy things. And he always tried to instill in me a sense of how much fun science was and how many opportunities there were for scientists. And he never had those as a kid and he, he tried to help me see that. So it's amazing you had this tremendous mentor you know, to help, help you understand that you can follow mm -hmm. the passion mm -hmm. that you really, really mm -hmm. love. What would you say to a young girl, oh, okay, a young man as well, um, who might not have that? I think that really there are the opportunities there, and, and I've had not only my mentor as a grandfather, but my teachers in high school. Mm -hmm. And I think if you reach out to them and say, you know, I really am interested in this, how can I, how can I do something with that? What chances and what opportunities do I have? Then, then you can really take it uh, a long way. There are some incredible teachers out there who really help mold and shape some, mm -hmm. some great scientists, and I don't think they get enough kudos for that, but wow. I would definitely say approach and talk to, talk to a teacher at school. Cool. Okay, so hear that. Um, if microbes had one thing to say to people, what do you think it'd be? Um, just a million jokes coming to my mind right now. Um, Microbes, we inherited the earth from microbes. Um, if you were to wipe out all life that you could see on earth, the biosphere would turn over and everything would be fine. If you were to wipe out the microbes, the entire ecosystem would collapse and, and we would not survive more than a few days. I think it's important for people to know that microbes aren't all bad, that most of the microorganisms you have on you actually protect you. If you're too clean, if you try to get rid of all of them, you open yourself up for the bad microbes. So I think the microbes would say, you know, give us a break. <laughs> <laughs> so if you were a microbe, what kind of microbe would you be? Oh, I would be an archaeon that made me thing. What, was, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> it's an extremophile, um, and it makes methane, and it's a good potential source. It makes methane. Meth methane. Get, um, meth how do you say it in American? Methane. In American? Methane. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yes, it makes methane gas. Oh, okay. How do you say it in British? Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> no, no, no. And so oh. tell me, tell me, what is next? No, wait, wait. Why? Why would you want to make? Methane? methane right now. Um, I'm actually considering climate yeah, changes. I'm, I'm actually working with so a lot of these um, deposits where they've they've pulled out natural gas and then they've just left that deposit and they've walked away. Well, the idea is that those microbes are still there, the microbes that made natural gas. So when you turn on your gas stove, microbes made that gas. So the idea is, can we feed them and get them to t make more uh, methane gas, methane gas? without having to like drill and dig and, and disrupt somewhere else. Oh, so that you actually take the, the, the methane um, and turn and actually use it as an energy source yes. as opposed to just putting it out into yes, the atmosphere exactly, and exactly, more yeah. greenhouse gases. What's next for you? Oh, gosh, um, I'm going to India. Do you do I'm what? I'm so excited. Um, well, there is um, potential collaborations. There's some Indian scientists who are interested in doing some cave microbiology and I'm gonna go help them figure out how to do that. So excited! It's a great job. <laughs> Go on, Go on with your best self. I thank you. Thank so you much. so much. Really, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.